I, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. It's really a pleasure to see everybody uh, out this evening for such a, a great lecture. Um, we're just so thrilled to have Vish, who I'm going to introduce here in just a second. Um, um, and just we were just talking, I'm just so glad that we could um, uh, find a spot in his schedule to, to come and join us. Um, uh, I've been excited about this for ever since he agreed to, to be able to come into Athens. Um, his uh, title, as you can see, is Beyond Access, Communication, Inequality, and the Implications for Health Disparities. And uh, this lecture is sponsored by the Grady College uh, Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism, which, uh, Pat Thomas. Uh, thank you, Pat. And also the Southern Center for Communication, Health, and Poverty. Uh, Dr. Vicki Frymuth heads uh, the center, and the center is actually located just down the hall. Um, and um, so once again, we're just really pleased to, to have all of you here tonight. And I hope that you can stay on uh, right after the lecture in the rotunda. We're going to have a, a reception there. And, and so hopefully you'll be able to stay for that as well. Um, as, as I had mentioned before, it's just such a pleasure to have uh, Dr. K. Vish Visanwath with us. Uh, he's really uh, just a, an extremely well-known scholar uh, nationally and internationally on health communication and health disparities. Uh, Vish received his uh, PhD in, in 1990 at the University of Minnesota, uh, at which then he joined my alma mater, The Ohio State University, uh, and served on the faculty of the School of Journalism and, and Communication there for 10 years. Uh, he was also an adjunct professor in the College of Public Health at Ohio State. Uh, and then joined the National Cancer Institute as a senior health communication scientist in the year 2000. In 2002, Dr. Vasanwath became the acting associate director of the behavioral research program in the Division of Cancer and Control of Population Science at the NCI. In this post, Vish oversaw the research efforts of 50 uh, scientists, fellows, and administrative staff on major NCI initiatives in cancer communication and in health disparities. He is also was the uh, program director there of the Institute's largest health communication initiative, the Centers for Excellence in Cancer Communication Research, and, led the uh, and was the lead project officer for the Health Information National Trends Survey. Uh, in 19, or in, I'm sorry, in 2004, Dr. Vasanwath joined the faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health and also serves as the co-leader of the health communication core of the Dana-Farber Har Harvard Cancer Center. He is the author of numerous books, uh, book chapters and reports, one of which is a current report in development for the Institutes of Medicine. This report is a review and assessment of the National Institutes of Health strategic research plan to reduce and ultimately to eliminate health disparities. It's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Vasanwa. I hope you can hear me and understand me. I too have an accent, a southern accent, no less, but South Indian accent. So hopefully uh, you can uh, make sense of what I'm saying, at least in terms of accent, if not the content. Uh, feel free to stop me or ask me any questions. Uh, if, if I'm going too fast, I get excited about my research and my topic, and then I start swallowing words and uh, say incomplete sentences. So feel free to stop me. I'll be happy to clarify. I can't change my accent, but certainly I can slow down. Uh, and I also realize that uh, at the end of a long day, I am between my talk is between you and the reception. Uh, you know, so you know, if you are like me, uh, food is of great interest. So I do feel guilty about it. So I'll try not to uh, extend the talk beyond what is necessary. But I have to somehow justify my trip here. You know, so 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 you'll have to bear with me on that front. You know. Uh, it's, a it's a great pleasure and honor to be here, uh, uh, to be with friends I have known for a long time and mentors. You know, uh, I really want to thank you for your excellent hospitality. You know, uh, uh, I think Pat, uh, uh, Vicky, and, and Jeff, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I have always followed your work and I have a lot of respect for your work. Uh, and uh, in fact, I'm even jealous of your group here. This is a fantastic group here, you know, and. Uh, 
and the work you are doing is just incredible you know it's a work after my own heart uh, and it's not in many places i think um, uh, vicky and pat and uh, uh, jeff can vouch for it there are not many places in the country which focus at the in, the inter, uh, uh, the on, on the topic of communication and health disparities the intersection very few places in the country which do that uh, there are places in the country which focus on health disparities there are places in the country which focus on health communications but very few people talk about health communications and health disparities and this is one of the few places and hopefully harvard will be one of them and and uh, that's what i have been focusing on so i think it's nice to come here and engage in a dialogue with you all uh, certainly uh, you know vicky's work has been inspiring i know i think you, not many of you know and i'm going to embarrass vicky here you know uh, vicky gave me my one of my first big breaks when she published one of my articles in a special issue of communications research uh now you may have regrets for doing that like okay, you know but uh, it's a bit too late now you know so uh, but certainly i think uh, you know so it, it, i have drawn a lot of inspiration from that work and it's just great uh, seeing pat who was a neighbor or who left boston i guess uh, when she heard that i was coming into town i think you know so she decided that was not the place for her i think Uh, so let me uh, talk about uh, this idea of communication and equality this is a concept and a construct i have been struggling with wrestling with for several years now uh, but i have never been able to formalize it in any meaningful way until i had the time to go to harvard and start thinking about it this has been there for a while you know we have been talking about it i recall making a presentation many many years ago uh what we call as a heads talk you know when i was a head of communication theory and methodology division at uh, of of AEJMC Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication uh when i presented some data on uh, uh this was in 1996 97 on on differences in uh, distribution of computers at home internet was not big yet uh differences in distribution of computers at home uh at 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 the talk at the head stock and you know, as i was an outgoing head of the division and and the next year and you know, for some reason i never published that talk you know and the next year of course you know the idea of digital divide entered the world and i said there i missed my only chance of becoming famous and rich and what not you know but uh but it's it's an idea i have been struggling with and and uh, most of my work has been on the knowledge gap hypothesis with which some of you may be familiar with you know and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second here but i have expanded that idea over time and and i think it's nice to come and offer some ideas and how to think about it and see if this has legs and if this resonates very well and if it connects in, in any way to the work we are doing ultimately the work being uh, reducing and eliminating health disparities which is uh, which is i think you know one of the most insidious and pernicious problems we are facing in the country today so uh what uh, uh i want to do i want to quickly go to the issue of of differential disease burden these these data are should be familiar to most of you if not all of you in terms of higher incidence rates i mean in a differential distribution of disease burden among different social groups so you can take any type of social group any type of social formation ethnicity race class uh social economic position social economic status however you want to call it you will see profound differences on many 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 uh uh, uh range of diseases uh and 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 uh, incidents uh for example here black males are much more likely to develop any type of cancer than white males um black women are likely to die from breast cancer than white women we know that you know black women and you know, the incidence rates are lower but the mortality rates are higher you know i mean it's just just uh, uh, you know and we can take cardiovascular disease and smoking uh, where there are profound health disparities uh, between different social classes here is an example of uh, cigarette smoking among adults if you are using education as a proxy for socio economic status clearly the incidence of rates of smoking have been coming down in the country but the rates are coming down at a very differential rate and and the highest uh, incidence of smoking uh, remains among those groups with uh, uh, less or uh, lower education uh, you can also see that uh, with the uh, prevalence of diabetes uh, again between years 2002 and 2005 uh, clearly uh, certain groups 
uh, are affected much more uh, heavily and highly by uh, in diabetes compared to other groups. In this case, uh, we are talking about race and ethnicity uh, as opposed to the previous slide. Uh, you can see that with obesity, uh, by this time, uh, uh, everyone is aware that obesity is an epidemic, quote unquote. Uh, though I always wondered, when is an epidemic an epidemic? And at what time uh, do you call it an epidemic? And sometimes I wonder if, if you are doing injustice uh, by terming it as an epi epidemic, framing it as an epidemic, you know, the, because it, has, it is associated with stigma uh, and, and discrimination, and that is a problem. But no, nonetheless, it is a serious problem. And, 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 and what you see here again is the increase in uh, rates of obesity, uh, or the incidence of obesity are again differential among uh, different groups. You know. So the question is, why do these disparities exist? Right? I mean, that is the question we are asking. And social epidemiologists have been uh, ans trying to provide answers in terms of social determinants. What they have said is that you know, a set of social determinants could potentially lead to the etiology of these diseases and these outcomes, those either at the individual level or at the population level. Uh, and some of the social determinants that have been identified are include social cohesion, uh, social stratification of some kind, depending upon how you want to measure it, uh, you know, class, uh, socioeconomic status, or socioeconomic position, uh, social networks, uh, neighborhood conditions, uh, social policies, including uh, health policies. So you can see a range of social determinants are being offered. Social epidemiology is a very interesting area. If you go back and think about communication itself, within communication sciences, you know, the individual level of analysis has always been the dominant level of analysis, except for critical theories. You know? And the same thing with social, uh, in, in public health, in epidemiology particularly, they always looked at population level issues uh, with the individual as a unit of analysis. You know, there has never been an attention to the social structural issues until Leonard Syme and uh, Lisa Berkman, Ichiro Kawachi, a number of them came, uh, actually Michael Marmot uh, and others uh, worked uh, on these topics from England and Berkeley and Harvard, uh, introduced the idea of social determinants uh, and, and introduced us to these notions of social class and neighborhood conditions. And so these are some of the explanations that they have provided uh, to explain the existence of health disparities. And in fact, here what I'm going to do is take this diagram from figure from George Kaplan, a well-known social epidemiologist from the University of Michigan, who tries to explain the ultimate position of individual and population health. I don't think I have a uh, pointer, but you know, this is the individual and population health. The question is, how do you, I'm sorry, I'm ruining it for you, I'm an art, you know, but so. <laughs> Uh, uh, so how do you explain that individual and population health? And Kaplan identifies a series of cascading layers of factors that could potentially explain this. So you can take the distal factors of social economic policies, and so in the social institutions, uh, including political and other types of institutions, neighborhood communities and neighborhoods, uh, living conditions, social relationships, as you can see, we're increasingly going down to the more micro level conditions, ultimately explaining individual and population health. A wonderful figure, right? I mean, it absolutely makes sense that all these conditions should affect individual and population health. The question is, how do we connect these proximal factors like pathophysiological pathways with the distal factors like social and economic policies? I mean, that is the challenge. It's nice to have this kind of a framework, but how do we actually connect it? And social uh, epidemiologists have been offering a number of different approaches to examine that at different levels of analysis. Uh, what I want to argue is that communication is what one potential thread linking the proximal to the distal factors. Obviously, uh, we are going to talk about it from a communication-centric centric perspective here, offering this is one possible way to explain how these different factors affect individual and population health. The question is how. Now, if you think about it, if you think about it, communication plays a critical role at every stage of these diseases, right? Every stage of these factors. Communication, one of public opinion literature, we can talk about how communication and uh, media coverage of issues influences social and economic policies and support for social and economic policies include you know, neighborhood and communities. Uh, I will give you some examples, but certainly uh, 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 social networks within neighborhoods, 
community newspapers within neighborhood influence how those neighborhoods function, structure, the power relationships among different people within those neighborhoods. So you can take communication at any of these levels and you can actually identify and the mechanisms through which communication can connect these different levels of analysis. So that's, that's where what I am trying to do, what our program, our lab is trying to do, introduce this idea of communication in a broad theoretical way and, and then look at how communication plays this role plays its role in connecting at uh, these different levels of analysis. So, uh, I, uh, so the question then is how does communication play a role? So we have been trying to struggle with this. You know, we have been wrestling with what can, how can we heuristically capture the role communication plays? Particularly, you know, I think if you are an audience like this, mostly with the communication audience, I don't have to explain my existence. But, you know, <laughs> right? But if I'm in public health and, and the Cancer Institute, every day is an interesting challenge because, you know, like, I mean, my colleagues ask me, what do you do in communication? <laughs> Intuitively, they know what communication is, right? They all know the importance of communication. But in terms of actually delineating what communication does is a tough issue. So what I have tried to do is, in a very heuristic way, try to capture it for them. You know, what role does communication play? How does it really help? And this helps me talk to my students in public health, my colleagues, you know, oncologists, uh, my public health colleagues who are epidemiologists, biostatisticians, you know, basically saying informational function, acquisition of knowledge, telling people how to do certain things, what are the risk factors uh, that influence disease outcomes, instrumental uh, functions in terms of enabling action. You know, if, if you want to tell people, it's just not enough to tell them uh, to go out and get a mammogram, but tell them actually where do you go and get it, you know? Uh, how do you go and how do you actually go about doing that, you know? In fact, Jim Limert, I think in one of the uh, books uh, that he wrote in 1960s or 70s, you know, talks about mobilizing information. Essentially, this is mobilizing information, providing instrumental action, you know, the idea of skills, you know, providing skills. Uh, social control functions, it defines social norms. This is an area I've been working on. For example, alcohol is a great example, you know. If you want to stop binge drinking, you know, it's a social control function where we define what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of behavior. And communication does it very successfully. And the communal function in terms of building that sense of fellowship, you know, communal nature in terms of uh, spirit of friendship, collegiality, networks, you know, uh, providing that access to what we have come to call as social capital. And it just doesn't, it's not exhaustive, but these are illustrative ways of thinking about functions of health communication, you know, and give us some idea of how we can categorize different functions, you know. I'm sure uh, if we go around this room, different people can come up with different uh, categories and classifications, which is fine, you know, but I like mine, you know, at least I have the floor, <laughs> I have the floor now, so, you know, but we can change that. You know, I'm open to discussion. So our lab has been working on this model, what we call as a structural influence model of communication. Uh, uh, and, and, and what we are right to do here is, I took the social determinants. Remember the social determinants we talked about early on. I said, okay, how do we connect these social determinants to these ultimate outcomes of health at the individual and population level? And so I started playing around with that idea Again, this is a heuristic framework which will help me capture how communication plays, you know, and what role does it play through these uh, mechanisms and cascading factors. So at one end of the spectrum, what you have are social determinants. For example, I discussed only two of them here, socioeconomic position and place. Neighborhoods are urban versus rural areas. So most of you are working on rural areas, for example, uh, which is very important, I think. We know that we haven't done a lot of work in that area. Uh, me mediating and moderating conditions, age, gender, race, and ethnicity. Uh, you may remember I am not using it as social demographics and simply because they stand for something. Race stands for something, right? Ethnicity stands for something. All the culture, uh, ec cultural experience that are associated with race and ethnicity. Same thing with gender, same thing with age. Uh, age is not just a uh, biological uh, uh, cut point, but it's more experiences in terms of cohort experiences, right? Depending upon which generation, which era you were born into. And then social networks and, and you know, what social networks provide, as we discussed, I've been talking to so many different groups today. So um, if I'm repeating, repeating myself, you know, just stop me. 
uh, but you know, again, networks provide you with that kind of information and resources that you need, intellectual material and others. You know. And that influences health communication outcomes uh, of health media use and exposure, uh, information seeking, attention to information, information processing. We were just talking about it early uh, with a, in a group with a Wiki. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and health outcomes. Uh, Dale Kunkel, who saw this group, some of you know Dale Kunkel, really loved this framework. But he started saying, well, I don't know whether knowledge should be there or should be somewhere else. You know, I said, you know, fine, fine. You know, I, as long as you like the model, I can always move things around. You know? But it's very interesting what it does, isn't it? Again, it, it kind of uh, provides a heuristic framework of how to think about these things. So we have been, so what I want to do is draw your attention to uh, uh, a couple of those things. This can work as a pointer, right? You know, it's, you know it took me some time uh, to realize that. But you know, so I'll, I'll try to focus on a couple of these uh, uh, factors and outcomes and show them in terms of socioeconomic status. You know, uh, to illustrate my broader theory of communication inequality. So well, how do I define communication inequality? So there are two ways, two levels of analysis, and two levels at which you can look at communication inequality. Uh, one is differences among social classes in the generation, manipulation, and distribution of information at the group level, at the macro level, and differences in access to and ability to take advantage of information at the individual level. Right? So there are, you can look at it at two different levels here. Uh, let me let me talk about societal level. I won't spend a lot of time on this today, uh, but uh, but uh, what do we mean by generation and manipulation of information? Let me just give you one example. Now, when we talk about inequality, inequality by definition is a structural property, right? You know, it, by definition, it's a structural property. So that is, you know, there is a pr difference. We are seeing a difference between two groups, right? Difference in terms of power, uh, and and. Take a tobacco company. A tobacco company has a tremendous capacity to take scientific information that is published. They, have, they can hire scientists of the field easily enough uh, and ask them to interpret the results for them. And once they have the favorable interpretation of the data, they have very sophisticated public relations set up and they can distribute that information through press releases. Right? That's what I mean, the capacity to generate information, manipulate information, and distribute information. And manipulation, I don't mean it in a very negative way at all. I mean it in a very sociological way. We all do that manipulation. That's what we do, right? I mean, uh, so, but uh, tobacco companies is a, one exemplar, and I'm using that as an illustration to talk about how you can conceptualize uh, communication inequality at, power, uh, at, at a macro level. So if you are a small community group, a social, co social movement group, which is trying to ban vending machine sales of cigarettes, for example, as I have done in Minnesota, um, you may not be able to hire expensive consultants. You may not be able to hire expensive public relations setup to distribute information, right? So that's why you go on the streets, you know, because you don't have the power to do that. You know, that's that's a power differential I'm talking about when I talk about communication inequality at the at, at the, at the uh, at, the, at the macro level. And of course, there is a differential capacity to act on that information too. We can, you can take that information, you can massage it in different ways, package it in different ways. I can uh, send 15 lobbies to uh, state legislature, I can, uh, or, or the national, uh, at the Congress, uh, or some, uh, or FTC, wherever it is. You know, it's been done in Minnesota, for example, uh, where uh, when Gene Forrester and others uh, uh, forced White Bear Lake, a small suburb in St. Paul, Minnesota, to ban vending machine sales of cigarettes. Uh, a number of cities in Minnesota saw that and said, this is a great idea. You know, uh, our young uh, people uh, buy cigarettes from vending machines, so why can't we do it? So a number of cities started, the, the model started diffusing in Minnesota, right? A number of cities started uh, banning vending machine sales of cigarettes. So what the tobacco companies did, they said, this is not working out. We can't really hire expensive lobbyists and lawyers for every city that is passing this ordinance. So they went and hired a lobbyist at the state government level. And they passed a law in the legislature which said, which usurped the rights of local cities and communities to ban vending machine sales. Just imagine that. 
you know, they just usurped that law. They said you can't do it. Local local communities do not have the right to pass these ordinances. Fortunately, there were a couple of enterprising journalists who got wind of it and publicized that fact. And the legislature was embarrassed and shamed into resending that law. You know, <laughs> so this is what I mean. You know, so I think you can you can have the ability to act on the information, uh, and that ability is not always equal. Now, what I want to do today is focus on more individual level of analysis to show some differences in access to and use of information, attention to health content, seeking information, the notion of volition, right, where you actually, actually go out and seek information, whereas use of information is much more adventitious, casual, incidental, uh, recall of knowledge, recall knowledge and comprehension, and capacity to act on information. I don't know how much time we have to go through all of them, but I'll just show you some illustrative examples and try to leave some time for questions and I can clarify and amplify uh, some of these issues uh, later in, in, in the question and answer discussion. Okay, so our recent work has shown clearly that SES, race, ethnicity, which are, they somewhat overlap, but they're distinct, so I want you to, I don't want you to misunderstand that I'm trying to uh, use them uh, synonymously here. I am not. Uh, our recent work has clearly shown that SES, race, and ethnicity are associated with subscription to cable or satellite, TV, and internet. And this, this should be familiar to most of you who are following this literature. Uh, daily readership of newspapers, uh, attention to health content in different media, and differential time with, spent with media, and knowledge gaps in health. And I'm, we are not the only people who are working in this area. A number of people are working in this area, except it's my PowerPoint. That's why I have put my names here. But actually, not. You know, now you must be getting an impression. This guy is so arrogant. You know, why did we even bring him here? Not really. You know, we are just trying to show the work that's being done out of my lab here, uh, for particularly focusing on uh, some of the recent uh, uh, health communication data from a national sample. You know. So let me show you some examples of that. I'm going to show you bivariate relationships, but I can, I, we have done multivariate analysis too, and this, this relationship holds. In fact, education sometimes swamps out everything else. Uh, so if you take daily newspaper readership by race, uh, you clearly you can see who reads newspapers more. You know, uh, obviously whites uh, claim that they read, new, read newspapers at least four times a week uh, compared to blacks. And obviously, the information, amount of information in newspapers is much more detailed uh, compared to uh, in other media. You know? So you can see the difference there. Uh, days read newspaper last week by education. Again, uh, people from higher, uh, people who have gone to college are much more likely to read newspapers with greater frequency uh, compared to people with uh, lower, less education. Again, none of this should be surprising or shocking to you. you know? I mean, these are very predictable relationships, I think. Uh, newspaper readership by income, uh, uh, by this time you are getting the idea, you know. Uh, it clearly, you know, it, it kind of pattern holds up as you go through these national data. Most of these data come from the Health Information National Trend Survey, uh, which Jeff mentioned. I was a co-leader of it uh, with a colleague of mine called Dave Nelson. Some of you know him, uh, who is now at CDC. Uh, what we, it's a health hints, as we call it. Uh, is, a, is a random sa random digit dial sample of 6,400 people, uh, and the first round of hints was conducted in 2002 and 2003, and we are uh, and there was a subsequent round too. So these are national level da data that uh, I'm drawing on uh, to make my points here. Uh, uh, I want to show access to cable and satellite services by different uh, uh, socioeconomic groups. Uh, clearly, again, what you see are differences. Uh, between, uh, if you take education, you can take any indicator of socioeconomic status here. Uh, take education, where high school or less, uh, folks with high school or less education are much less likely to subscribe to cable or satellite TV compared to some college plus. Uh, same thing with internet, of course, the gap in internet is much more profound, uh, much more higher. Uh, same thing with in income, uh, employment status, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, race, uh, and uh, ethnicity. Now, uh, you might ask me why cable and satellite, why am I focusing attention on it? As you know, uh, broadband TV is available, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm watching too much TV, I think. Uh, broadband uh, internet access service is available through cable or satellite, so you ought to have uh, some sub sub subscription to cable uh, to access broadband. 
and we have evidence now come, uh, building up which shows that if you have if you have access to broadband uh, cable or broadband internet you spend more time with internet you know uh, and you you do many more things with internet uh, whether that translates to more knowledge or not is an empirical question you know uh, but that at least is a potential theoretical opportunity that exists uh, right now and uh, internet is a great example here now you will see different data you will see uh, uh, newspaper stories about how the digital divide is narrowing how different groups are able to access internet and my argument to that is show me the data show me reliable data i am not claiming that the digital divide is narrowing maybe it is but if you look at the data closely you know you are already hitting a asymptote there is a group of people you know it the curve is not raising you know so there is a group of people who are not accessing internet my interest is in focusing on that 30% of the people who don't have access to internet that's what we are working on right now and if you look at closely at all these different studies that are coming out some are very reliably collected some data with random sample surveys of some kind so but other surveys are done on internet for example <laughs> you know uh, and and so you want to you want to really closely examine this data uh, to I, i'm not saying it's not narrowing you know but i think there are there are several issues in terms of uh, data you know we have been looking at them we have been trying to analyze this data in terms of representativeness and it's somewhat some of the assumptions are questionable even though there is some good news somewhere there right with all that horse manure there should be pony some a pony somewhere it's the same thing with all these data sets showing narrowing maybe there is some hope for us you know but there is this 30% who still don't have access in fact if you look at more reliable data it's about 65% who have access uh, at home and 35% who don't so it depends on whose numbers uh, you are looking at uh, it's just not hints uh, from nci uh, these are census data so census data also clearly demonstrate the same relationship and same patterns again you know when i started presenting this data in different places you know i would get questions from people oh well that is from hints but i have seen in other data sets that it is narrowing and my argument is well here is another reliable data uh, data set let's look at it you know and it shows the same uh, relationship uh, this is actually more interesting because it shows multimedia exposure uh, in many ways and uh, there are some interesting patterns here uh, i want to come back to that uh, in in terms of uh, exposure to television viewing where you don't find a, a lot of uh, uh, differences and i want to come back to that point about the role of television uh, in in a uh, television social class uh, this is the question that pretty much documents uh, percentage of respondents who went online to look for health information in the us and uh, what you see so i tried to capture a number of different determinants in one place again 50% of the in sample said they have gone online to look for health information but when you look at it who are the people who actually went and did it again you find uh, significant differences uh, among different social formations or groups okay so in i have shown you inequality in use and access to information but inequality in access to and use of information also goes along in terms of language as you know depending upon which state you are in 3 to 40% of the people in that state are non english speakers right so if you are in montana and idaho i hope nobody is from montana and idaho to check my numbers here uh maybe it's about 3% or 4% i think you know but if you are in california and it's about 40% non native speakers of english and certainly what you find are very interesting differences between so if you take if you take right we we in a knee jerk way not in this audience but in usually in a knee jerk way we use hispanics as one broad category right and here what we are trying to show is we took hispanics but we asked them in hence whether they want to interview in english whether they want to interview in spanish and we separated them into hispanics into two groups people who responded in english people who responded in spanish and the people who resp- hispanics who responded in english are like any other group of people you know but the people who responded in spanish hispanics are very different now this is again another way to isolate and understand where is that inequality coming from if you really want to do something about it now how do we really you know identify this group of people 
you know and as you can see there are uh, differences in terms of the different media they use uh, and time spent with different media between these two groups you know in terms of credibility and ratings again uh, <coughs> what you see is they also have different levels of trust of different media you know this again goes back to some of the discussions we had throughout the day you know i mean what channels can we use to reach these people and i think this gives us some pointers in terms of what do they rely on where do they go for information who do they trust uh, and 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 i think that would be helpful in terms of planning uh, you know future interventions i'm sorry i'm going very fast if i'm going fast you know uh, uh, but i'm sure you're getting the idea of uh, you know how i'm moving forward in terms of my thesis here uh, inequality in attention to health information uh, education and income are positively related uh, uh, to the attention they pay to health information in different media so we ask them you know how much attention do you pay to health content in the media and they respond on a scale and what you see is clear differences uh, uh, among uh, uh, different uh, socio economic status groups fortunately not so the case with race and ethnicity that is good news so the argument is it is not that they are not attentive it is not that racial and ethnic groups are not interested in it they are interested in it they are attentive to it the question is do they have some barriers which force them you know which which deter them from getting the information they want i think you know and there are differences in attention to media by language you know and these are a couple of slides i don't want to go through a lot of them here but these are illustrative again uh, i wanted to put this slide because it offers some interesting tidbits so when we ask them how much attention do you pay to health content in different media uh, what you see is not a lot of difference on television but the differences start widening as we use different media radio newspapers magazines and internet right internet is tricky because internet is deliberate right there is a lot of volition behind it uh, so i mean why would you attend to health information if you are i mean why would you go on to a health site if you are not interested in it right so we are uh, so conceptually what does it mean is a reasonable question to ask i think you know see i'm offering my limitations too right here so <laughs> Uh, but it's interesting how uh, this pans out uh, i know uh, television is very interesting television is a great leveler you know um uh, there are a couple of issues with television uh, that i want to raise before you i point out the problem with it you know uh, one is of course we are talking about television as a medium but not about the content of the television right so the, they may vary in the content so somebody may watch c span as opposed to somebody may be watching gasna girls or something like that yeah. right so it, it's a different uh or did i am i getting the name right maybe not that's my popular culture you know so uh uh but uh so we are not talking about the content as much as uh, uh as the, as a medium itself uh, but in all, in acad academic setting also we don't want to admit everybody watches television right we are all reading new york review of books or new yorkers and none of us want to admit we watch tv but the fact of the matter is these differences disappear a lot you know people do watch tv whether they admit to it or not you know so um uh, again uh, uh, so it's the same thing uh, uh, i just you know uh, uh, this is among different racial groups uh, it shows you know uh, w- one thing about this is uh, we do notice uh, quite a bit about african americans spending more time with television uh and and attention to television so we we don't we haven't uh, the, one of the problems with this kind of a data set at the national level is we don't know how to probe it what does it really mean when different uh, data or uh, one piece of datum doesn't uh, coincide or align very well with another piece of datum so we are really struggling with it and we are doing some focus groups uh, to do some in depth analysis on what does these what do these things really mean but the point uh is is uh, remains uh okay uh, so let me also sh- so uh, i want to show you something else i have talked about access and use of information and i am uh, we talked about attention to health content in the media i want to spend just a few minutes a couple of minutes on information seeking now this these data were startling to us 
this is one of those adventitious out in you know serendipitous findings we came up with what happened was uh, I, i think i was telling somebody today in in a group that the assumption commonly made is that if you are struck with a serious illness you go out and actively seek information right because you want a second opinion you want to know more about it uh, you want to discuss with your provider and so on and so forth particularly if you are struck with something like cancer you have to make a lot of uh, decisions very complicated decisions on treatment which has side effects uh and 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 so you out to go out and seek information in theory at least we found in our hints analysis that about 28 to 30% of people who are cancer patients or who have history of cancer do not seek information outside the medical encounter so when we ask them have you sought information on have you looked for cancer information outside your medical encounter or more uh, outside what was provided by your medical provider uh, about 28 to 30% said no you know that was a quite a bit of a surprise to us we should not have been uh, and we started investigating who are these non seekers so to speak because our bias our bias in the system is everybody goes out and seeks information right uh, you buy a car you know you investigate quite a bit right uh so what is it despite the serious illness why don't they seek information so we looked at who are these people and it was very clear to us that this is a group of people who have very low incomes uh and low education uh, as you can see and there is a concentration of minorities uh in this group uh you know uh, about 20 per- 18% are non white about 7% are hispanic Uh, who are non seekers right so what we are now doing is we are trying to flesh out uh, these non seekers in fact uh, we have a piece coming out uh, in in uh, in uh, health communication uh, one of these days uh, one of these years or one of these days i think you know I, uh, um, uh, it's a special issue of uh, health communication i think it is a 75th anniversary issue and we looked at non seekers in greater detail now the question is does it really matter right i mean so what if i don't seek information outside the medical encounter if it doesn't matter in health uh, substantive health uh, uh, outcomes uh, who cares whether you seek information or not so we actually looked at some of the health behaviors it's cross sectional data so we can't make any causal attributions what we found is people who are non seekers are also heavier they consume fewer servings of fruits and vegetables uh, they also are less likely to engage in physical activity uh and they were also diagnosed at a later stage in for cancer so we so there is there seems to be something else going on there you know uh the non seeking status is related to other conditions uh whether non seeking is leading to something else or that something else is causing non seeking we can't tell you at this stage what we are doing is we have a grant uh we are looking at right now exploring this notion of non seeking and seeking in greater depth Uh, and trying to understand that okay uh so we talked about seek use of information we are access to information we talked about attention uh and we talked about seeking and now i want to talk about understanding and comprehending that information and uh, there is confusion that uh, uh, we discuss this in different fora today in different groups there's a lot of information out there i did not show the first three slides I had shown you the first three slides in i think my piece that is going around uh, actually documents the health information that is out there in the information environment right and 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 all the information is on prevention diagnosis treatment and so on and so forth but you know uh, 38% of the respondents uh, 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 of hints with less than high school education said that there are too many recommendations to follow uh, uh, uh for cancer prevention you know i mean it's it's understandable again Uh, because you know uh, as i said uh, and uh, I, i continue to say this you know it is really embarrassing uh, that you know that in this day and age the mess we are making with and this is the phrase i'm been using you know the mess we are making with either mammography or hormone therapy and if you look at newspaper coverage as well as what scientists it's just not the media right you know my colleagues in 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 the cancer world uh have a knee jerk reaction oh those media they sensationalize everything and i tell them who who did the news release you know 
right? I mean, it's a you know, every time I publish a piece, you know, our office of communication comes and says, oh, can we, shall we do a news release? Can we do one? You know. So I mean, you know, and I tell them we don't have to do it every time. You know, this I mean, <laughs> you know, I, 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 this finding may not hold up next month. You know, in a different study. Uh, but so uh, the point is, I, I think there is a lot of information and the confusion we are causing. I think you know. Uh, is, is amazingly, uh, I think, an egregious in many ways. Um, and health literacy is a major problem, as you know, uh, about 50%, uh, uh, depending again, of the US adults lack basic adult literacy skills. Uh, and I don't use the term health literacy a lot because I have trouble defining health literacy, and I have trouble measuring health literacy, and I have trouble relating health literacy to to, to health outcomes. Now you got my, you got my position on health literacy. Uh, 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 I like health literacy. It's like mom and apple pie. You know, who doesn't like health literacy? Who can be against health literacy? But I still, I'm having trouble understanding health literacy. It's a comprehension gap I have between me and other health literacy votaries. Uh, so I also talk about knowledge gap hypothesis. Uh, knowledge gap hypothesis is something that was proposed first by Tichner, Donna, and Olin. Some of you must have heard about it, essentially arguing that increasing flow of information into a system is more likely to benefit people from higher socioeconomic status than those from lower socioeconomic status, thus widening the pre-existing gaps uh, in information than narrowing them. This is a counterintuitive hypothesis, right? Our idea is there is a problem, let's go out and do public health education. Right? That's what we do. We do public education, and narrow gaps should narrow. But knowledge gap hypothesis is arguing if you do that, you are actually likely to widen the gaps than then narrowing them. Right? And and my point is, uh, and and people have you know looked at, uh, at 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 this hypothesis. You know, if this hypothesis is true and holds across all conditions, we might as well close our offices and shops and go home because it's very depressing. Right? I mean, what what can we do? Uh, to really narrow the gaps, you know. But the point is, fortunately, we know that gaps don't always open up. In fact, we know that there are conditions under which gaps widen, and there are conditions under which gaps actually narrow. Much of it depends upon, and we did a 25-year review of knowledge gap. A number of people have written critiques of knowledge gap. Vicky wrote one, Brenda Derwin, uh, a number of other people have done uh, uh, critiques of knowledge gap. And what we found is that it depends upon how you define the problem. You know, in terms of relevance or non-relevance to them. You know, so if you define a problem as relevant to a group of people, I think people are much more likely to learn. Social conflict and mobilization, in terms of outrage and conflict, has you know messages, information diffuses in times of conflict conditions. I am now in the world of public health. In public health, public health in some ways is very conservative. You know, so whenever somebody says, you know, how do we really increase information flow, I gently tell them, how about creating conflict, you know? And they don't really like that suggestion, you know, because you know, they don't do conflict. We do interventions, you know. But it has been demonstrated very well. You know, Larry Wallach goes about talking social conflict. He gives the term media advocacy, you know. Social tobacco control movement, the social movement of tobacco control is actually singularly responsible uh, for the reduction of tobacco use in this country, even though they don't get as much credit. I can tell you, and I mean, they have worked very hard. You know, I, I think the scientists would have been still publishing in peer-reviewed journals, and nobody would have read them, except that the tobacco control movement picked it up, agitated on the streets, lobbied for it, advocated for it, I think. You know? So I think it has a lot of function, and people learn about tobacco, harmful effects of tobacco. And again, depending upon where you are, whether rural or urban communities, again, gaps may or may not open up, right? And prior knowledge helps. And this is a tricky thing. You know, Price and Zeller and others have looked at it. You know, and, and, uh, and, and I think you know, if you have already some technical information, scientific information, it's easy to build on that, you know? And motivation, interest, and salience, if you are motivated to learn, you'll be able to learn more about it, and gaps can narrow. Uh, in fact, I think the piece I referred to earlier uh, on motivation, I think the one uh, Wiki published in a special issue, actually deals with motivation. But my point is there is an interaction between motivation, interest, and salience, and socioeconomic status. So higher socioeconomic status groups are also more motivated, more interested, uh, uh, and find information more salient than lower SES groups. And these are some of the illustrative examples to show knowledge gaps. Uh, uh, what, he, what you see here is uh, the percent of people saying that their chances of getting cancer 
by a lot or some with exposure uh, by two groups, education. In this case, you see smoking and exposure to sun. Now, you would expect after all these years, right, 1964 was the first report that came out with, uh, from the Surgeon General on smoking. We shouldn't find any gaps anymore, right? After all these years, you still have, you know, a 10 percentage point gap on smoking and cancer. In fact, in fact, what you see here is a wonderful, I mean wonderful in a statistical sense, uh, <laughs> gradient of education. So if you actually divide this group into different educational levels, you actually see a very nice gradient. And, 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 and I think about, um, I think I, I'm, I'm making up the number now, I don't know the exact, I don't recall the exact number, but somewhere about eight to 10 percent, I think seven or eight percent uh, of people with less than high school education said uh, there is uh, the chance of getting cancer are really minimal uh, when you smoke, you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, exposure to sun, we can understand, right? I mean, it's not diffused as much as, as, as tobacco, but you can see the differences there also. Um, uh, this the same relationship by income, you know. Okay, so uh, inequality in capacity to act on information, action uh, is subject to opportunity structure. If you think about it, you know, there's a lot of attention to obesity, right? And what we are now calling as energy balance you know, or energy imbalance. You can advocate as much as you want about eating fresh fruits and, I mean, fruits and vegetables, uh, different numbers of servings, go out and exercise. But we know from the literature, you, you know, you have to have access to green space. If you live in a, in a bad neighborhood where you step out and you're afraid of getting mugged or, or getting shot, or you don't, at least in terms of perceptions, don't feel safe, you're not going to go out and take that path. If you live in a neighborhood which doesn't have sidewalks or well-maintained sidewalks, you're not likely to go out and get exercise. If you live in a neighborhood where there is no green space, no parks, Jim Salas and others have shown this, you know, you're not likely to go out and exercise. You can't afford to go out and spend $70 on gym, you know, as a, a fee to, you know, join a gym. I think so we have to be very realistic. Even if you know that you should, you're supposed to do it, do you have the ability, the capacity uh, to go out and act on that information. Same thing with uh, grocery stores, you know, you can't have, you know, we know that, you know, that, you know, bodegas and others don't carry the kind of uh, vegetables and fruits and uh, uh, other kinds of healthy food that they are supposed to carry. So if you are in a neighborhood, you know, that doesn't have grocery stores, uh, there is no way you can act on and follow up on the information you know, you know. And theories of neighborhood disorder have clearly shown how they influence physical activity. And, 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 and again, you know, uh, which makes my, uh, pretty much, you know, what I said earlier. So I think there are differential capacities among people in terms of acting on that information. Again, so it's a, again, a, a manifestation of uh, communication inequality of some kind. So the question then is, what is the future? What does the future look like? So will disparities disappear with technological advances? People always tell me, Benjamin Campaign wrote a piece a long time ago. He said, oh, this knowledge gap idea is, uh, and the information gap idea doesn't hold water because look at telephones, look at electricity. You know, electricity, when it was first introduced in this country, you know, was uh, acquired by people who are rich, wealthy households. But today, everyone has access to electricity. Uh, same thing with uh, telephones. 98% of American households have access to landlines and telephones. Is that a reasonable conjecture when it comes to communication inequality? Is that a reasonable occurrence or outcome? I don't know. It's an empirical question. And the reason I don't know is with improvement in technology comes greater demand for high-end equipment. Right? So here is the issue. If we take Computers, computers are becoming cheaper, right? $400, $500, you go out and spend a computer, you have a computer at home. But internet costs money, right? It will cost you anywhere from $15 to $75, depending upon where you are, right? Internet is a recurring expenditure, as opposed to a computer, which is a first uh, one-time expenditure, right? The, then the reason, of, it's a reasonable to ask. You know, so will, even if you have advanced technologies, will it disappear? Will the gaps disappear? 
Some cities are introducing this notion of wireless uh, access to internet, right? Boston wants to talk about it. Philadelphia is doing it. San Francisco wants to do it. Great idea. Now, how many people will have access to laptops, right? Plus, how many people will have ability to use laptops and computer, right? The groups we are interested in, in th this audience, in this room is interested in, right? We are doing some studies on it, you know? In fact, uh, it's, it's very interesting, you know, some of these households where we are placing computers and training them on internet use, they don't even have desks. We actually had to buy desks for them to put the computers on, you know? Uh, so I think uh, it, it I, I don't know whether, disappear, whether inequalities will disappear just because technology is advancing. It's an empirical question. Convergence of technology, people are saying everybody has a cell phone. In the future, you can do many things with telephone, uh, right? With a cell phone, you can, you can intervene, you can download songs. Yeah, it's all very interesting. Try doing an intervention over cell phone. People are trying to do that. There are some experiments that are happening, but let's make it, let's see if that is generalizable, you know? I don't know. Again, it's an empirical question, you know. Uh, and, 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 and you can't do with the cheap telephones, cell phones, you know. You do want to buy expensive cell phones to do that, you know. It's doable, you know, but I don't know, you know. Uh, would I watch uh, uh, Desperate Housewives on, 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 on cell phones? I don't know. I would rather have this big TV to watch that, right? <laughs> but people are trying to do that. It's an, again, let's see if that happens or not, you know. Um, so whether the cost will come down, whether it becomes cost efficient as technologies advance, I think is a questionable issue. Uh, and whether we can use these different types of media delivery systems to overcome the issue of inequality, again, is an empirical question. I don't know. I mean, that's something to think about, right? The other thing is um, technology is always changing, right? So a computer that was four years old doesn't work with the software of today, right? You have to increase the RAM, you have to increase the disk space, you have to get an update, you know? So you have to constantly invest in more technology, right? So the question then again, if, if technology improves uh, and the places higher demand, can people catch up and keep up with it, right? The other question I have is, does increasing sophistication using and operating new technologies leave some groups behind, you know? I think, you know, it's like VCRs. Remember, we used to talk about VCRs like that. You know, can anybody program VCRs? It's the same thing with TVOs or DVRs. You know, I mean, something or other always comes up. Uh, and, you know, as I said, uh, when we were intervening in this group, uh, people did not know how to type, you know. And you can relate to, some of us can relate to this story because we have seen it in other case studies where they don't even want to touch the keyboard, right? Because less something happens to the keyboard. Uh, can we train them? The other part of it is I have focused so far only on technology and access. Content. People vary in the content in, to which they are exposed. And we haven't paid much attention to that issue at all. You know? So my argument is I don't know. I think it's an empirical question to see if communication inequalities can narrow or disappear, or they may narrow and disappear in some realms but open up in other realms. You know? So I just want to acknowledge uh, members of my lab uh, you know, who are working with me, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I do the road shows and I go, go and I take the credit, but the real work is actually done by uh, my students and project uh, directors, you know, who are uh, um, actually uh, doing the real work behind it. So let me thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. I do think this is an extremely important issue. Uh, it, it is, as I said, it is a shame uh, that health disparities continue to exist and even widen in some cases. And I think communication can play a very central, critical, significant role in, in reducing, if not eliminating, at least reducing health disparities, I think. And so we all actually have a lot to contribute. And hopefully, I think, you know, by focusing attention on inequalities and identifying them as inequities that is unacceptable, uh, hopefully we'll be able to identify some solutions and address those uh, problems. You know. Thank you.